declare the meeting open. Um, welcome to our council meeting for Thursday the um, 10th of May. And we will open with apologies this morning. I have an apology for absence from the Mayor. I have an apology for an early departure from Jimmy Chen. And I have an apology for a late arrival from Vicky Buck. So I'm happy to move those um, apologies. Pauline Cotter is happy to second. All those in favour? Against? That's carried. Um, item two, declarations of interest. Um, I'm not aware of anything. If anything becomes apparent as we move through the meeting, please make that known. Um, now moving to item three, um, item 3.1, the public forum. Um, and it's my pleasure this morning to welcome um, Poto Williams, the MP for Christchurch East. Um, Poto, good to have you with us this morning. Um, welcome. You have um, five minutes um, to address the council. Um, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, kia ora, Andrew, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Good morning, councillors. Just want to acknowledge behind me I've got a team from um, Richmond and Shirley community. Thank you uh, this morning for coming along. Just a sec, I, won't, I promise I won't take up too much of your time. I know you're busy. Um, I've been the local member of parliament for Christchurch East for about five years. Um, and for the last two and a half, three years or so, I've produced a report that lists my activity and the reports show that about 5% of the work that my office deals with is actually within the council jurisdiction. You know, drains, rubbish, uh, breaches of consents and the like. So it's quite a significant amount of work that we do to support our council. I work with officials directly um, and with staff, sometimes with councillors and community board members, but the way that I work is actually to hold my line until I get a result. Um, on a recent visit that, were all, that was organised by the residents of Shirley and Richmond, myself and Mike Davidson, in the space of about an hour or so, met with six individuals and families to discuss a variety of issues that I have brought uh, to you today. Um, you have a copy of the, the documents that the residents gave me on that day, um, and I hope you uh, take the opportunity to read it. It makes for compelling reading. They talk in uh, their various submissions about lack of repair, um, lack of repair of drains, of roads, of footpaths that are impassable, of trip hazards and general neglect. And they also talk how they are impacted by the widening of drains um, due to the flocked and flooding, and how they've been treated by officials and staff and contractors. I met with three households directly, one woman who's on this beautiful property, she's across the creek from the contractors. She suffers from the movement of machinery, from the dumping of material during the day and then at night she has, she's she got to put up with um, the uh, sound of um, <coughs> generators and pumps disturbing her, her space. She's actually also got to mitigate her property for safety for when her grandchildren visit. I heard from another uh, uh, family whose driveway has had to be carved out to widen a drain. They argued with council officials for five months that she would not be able to get her vehicles in and out of her garage. Five months. It took five minutes for an official to go down there and, and try attempt to put her car into the garage for, to realise that they'd made a mistake and they had to actually do something about their plans. They argued for five months. There was another, I didn't actually meet the person, but a situation where a guy has not had access through his uh, driveway to his property for the best part of a year and has to cross the creek across a scaffold platform, which is completely inappropriate. And I was shocked by what I saw. But what was even more shocking was when I went to a citizenship ceremony that evening and spoke to a councillor about what I'd seen that day, I got... Uh, from that council, and I'm paraphrasing, that the East has had more than its fair share of rates. That shocked me even more, and I've been stewing about it ever since. I was not expecting to have this expressed in such a blatant way, and perhaps that councillor said it to, who said it to me doesn't really realise how bad it is, and doesn't really realise how bad that statement was. I believe such is the negative bias that has gone on unchallenged about the East, and I'm here to remind you that as elected representatives, you have to get rid of your negative East biased attitudes and change your frame of reference. You are about to embark upon an allocation of resource in the long-term plan, and you need to use a lens of equity of amenity for all citizens. 
so that the citizens of the east suburbs can have access to the same amenities at the same level as anyone else in the city. If I think about the residents that I met that I sent you the information on, they are making sacrifices for the benefit of the whole city, and in particular the residents of Flockton Basin, and they deserve to be treated with respect and kindness. What you as councillors say matters. You are our civic leaders and you have resource at your disposal and discretion. Attitudes that are expressed by councillors permeate to the officials who write the reports that you use to base your decisions on. And they permeate to staff and their dealings with the public. I implore you to read the material I sent you and see it for what it is. It's a specific case about a specific neighbourhood, but it's also representative of the inequity that we experience across the suburbs of the East. I implore you to embark upon a community roadshow to see and hear from locals what their concerns are and how we feel we have been treated. This is a small microcosm of what the issues in the eastern suburbs are, but it's representative of the way we feel we have been treated and had our views and wishes for our communities dismissed. We need to do this together. I congratulate the councillors and the community board members from the eastern suburbs and I now see how big your challenge is that you face to get our projects across the line. I'm here to support your efforts and to work with you. We are all citizens of this city and we deserve a fair allocation of resource to ensure that we can move on from the quakes. We didn't cause the quakes, but we continue to be impacted by them and Council has a vital role in helping us to recovery to the same level as anyone else in the city. Please treat us with fairness and ensure that we have an equitable allocation to support the things that we need to help our community thrive. Thank you. And thank, and thank you very much for coming along and raising these matters this morning. And thanks also for your offer of support. It's important that we, we work together um, to resolve these issues. Um, I'm aware of a body of work which is going on through the community board. I'm also aware of some communications which have... Um, been handled through our um, communications team in recent days, but there are certainly some good suggestions that, um, that have been made in your presentation this morning. We'll read the papers which have been supplied with interest, um, and if that leads on to um, further conversations and further work that needs to be done, well, this will have been a very useful exercise. So thank you very much indeed once again for joining us this morning. Thank Kia ora. So now moving to item 3.2, um, deputations by appointment, there are none. Item 4, presentation of petitions, there are none. Item 13, um, supplementary reports. Um, so we've got the one um, additional report, Tyora QE2 Recreation and Sports Centre New Cafe Lease. Um, I'm happy to um, move the resolution that we receive and include that report in today's agenda. Do I have a seconder? Sarah Templeton, all those in favour? Against, that's carried. So now moving on to um, item three, which is the Strategic Capability Committee minutes. Um, so a resolution that we receive the minutes, which I'm also happy to move. Pauline Cotter, happy to second. All those in favour? Against, that's carried. Okay, staff reports, item six, financial performance report for the nine months to the 31st of March. Um, do we have staff, Diane, are you um, joining us for this one? Thank you very much. And are there intro any introductory comments that you'd like to make to this report? Um, yes, good morning, and yes, there are, thank you. Um, I'm pleased to advise that the um, work we alluded to when this report was written about general managers working with their teams to cut back all non-essential expenditure has actually been quite successful to date. The April report is much improved. It is showing a um, surplus now of 2.4 as opposed to the deficit that was there. Um, but I would caution while we have a reasonable degree of confidence in that, um, there are sort of eight weeks of the year remaining and the bad news does tend to arrive in the last eight weeks. We hope we've provided for that, but I guess I can't be absolutely certain. 
Thank you very much. Um, so this report is coming straight to Council because we don't have a Finance and Performance Committee meeting this month because of the work that we're doing on the LTP. So um, are there any questions for Di on this report? Yanni. Um, I was just trying to get some understanding. I think the previous finance report had reference to, um, I thought it was Botanic Garden staff or um, operational staff being charged to Hegley Oval. In this report, we've got, I think it's been pointed out, the reverse. We've got Botanic Garden staff charging time to Hagley Park, and we're now being told that there's a, a halt on non-urgent spending and a review underway. Can you just um, give us some understanding of what's going going on there? Um, in short, no, not, not, um, it, no. I mean, I'm sure I can go away and find out, but I don't have it right at my fingertips. I'm sorry. Right, okay. So I, this I relates... Think we did previous at the Finance Committee when we got the other information around Hagley Oval, ask for some additional information so, and clarification. Um, the information that I have is the first sentence is due to um, parks restructuring. Um, some char staff were charging to the wrong code, so parks have corrected that. Right. Um, and the second um, sentence is uh, a different issue to charging. It's because the parks area is forecasting the overspend at the end of the year, so we're reviewing the budget to try and pull back the budget into line, as with other work that's been done. Right, and can you just give us a sense of, in terms of um, the capital, around the parks and the operational. Um, like we've got a number of new sports fields that have been, or existing sports fields being upgraded, which I think are having unfavorable budgets. Is yes. that, we've also had through the LTP submissions around concern that we're upgrading these fields, but we don't have enough money to, for operationally to maintain them. Is there, is there any comment just at a high level around the sports fields upgrades? and how those budgets are tracking versus the OPEX that we're putting in place? Uh, we can get you some information on that. Um, I think some of the comments are relate to when um, parks are transferred to us, so some of the public realm and things like that, particularly, for instance, when Otako transfers some, we need to right. make sure that we incorporate OPEX into that. Okay. Um, so there's been a, a large number of parks added over time. So if we can get some information on that and circulate mm. that around everybody, that would be great. Thank you very much. And are you, sorry, just in relation to that then, the final question, are you expecting like when things like um, the former CTV site gets transferred over that we'd get a report to council just, you know, probably showing us what, what's there, what the ongoing OPEX is, or would you uh, see that as just a sort of memo? Or? Um, well, I, I think we can um, update you on those things um, so that, um, uh, and, uh, as I recall, Bruce Rendell um, or um, did send out some Ridiculous. information. Yeah. Um, and we have indicated in that email that our report will be coming to yeah. finance and performance um, shortly on all of those, those matters. Um, but in terms of the OPEX budgets, we can make sure we have the input from the people like my friend, which is all good, yeah. <laughs> uh, about that in that, um, in that report. So okay. We're aiming, I think, to get that into the June um, meetings. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Sorry. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Um, a question here on the special funds, so page 13. Now it looks at the capital endowment fund forecast to be over allocated. Um, position will improve by $90,000 if Christchurch NZ secures the $1.4 million worth of funds. So does that mean that Christchurch NZ has bid for funds that we're currently, so we're, we're currently allocated money anyway to it? through the Capital Endowment Fund for, for one of those projects? Yes, we always allocate Christchurch New Zealand funds come partly through the Capital Endowment Fund. Um, we're simply flagging that depending on what the outcome is of the long-term plan, there could be a change. But the, the $90,000 there, does that mean that we've, we've allocated $90,000 to something that will then not be needed if Christchurch NZ gets it through LTP instead? Yes. So what, what was that 90000 for? Do you know? Well, they don't, I d they don't break it down into tiny amounts. It's sort of a large amount of funding that's provided to Christchurch New Zealand. So yeah. we don't have visibility through to what, thing, to what it's used for. But we've got visibility on the Capital Endowment Fund and what we <coughs> allocate that for. Yes, but it's their general funding. It's their general funding? <coughs> yes. By $90,000? Yes. Is it, is it not for events, some of their events that we transferred over? 
We will check that for you. But, yeah, it's um, a spe- it, very specific amount. It would have it would have been part of the um, in the, in terms of the transfer and the establishment of um, Christchurch NZ. Uh, we transferred some of the funding that we had for particular things, and I, sus- I my suspicion is it was for some of the events that were transferred. It's over. just that the the LTP <coughs> bit is then covering something that we think that we're already covering for them. Some of it. So the LTP bid is for a number of things, yeah. um, including quite major specific. events. Yeah, so, so we can find out specifically what that's for. Yeah. Um, but I, I think as it was established, um, some of the things that we transferred over included things like some of the um, events that we were providing that came out of the um, Capital Endowment Fund. But we would, I just need to check that. Yeah. So it would be interesting alongside for the LTP discussion to find out whether that means that we could reduce the 1.4 by 90,000 and still achieve the same thing, given that we've got the 90,000 here. It would be an, it, this will be an interesting piece of information to feed into um, the LTP deliberation around this particular item, which given the submissions that we've heard, um, we, we will almost certainly be having. Well, the other question is whether um, it frees up 90,000 in the That's right. endowment. Fund. Indeed, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Um, All right, and thank you. Another, another one here. Um, Similar to Yanni's point where there's, it seems to be things that are cross-budget areas. So on page 20 of our agenda, it looks at the permanent forecast overspend in roads and footpaths as driven by the major cycleways projects. Um, and then on the next page, in transport, the major cycleway programme is the main driver for the year-to-date underspend. And having the cycleways project across two different budgets means that it's not particularly clear in this kind of reporting um, how that is tracking. Yep. <laughs> so if we can do something to make that, I don't know, clearer, you know, how does that how does that work in the budget? You know? Um, so Sarah, you recall in the capital watch list report that goes up to the finance yeah. and performance committee we do a whole separate list on the major works. And yeah. yeah, it's just that in one area it's overspent, the other area is underspent, but they're in two separate areas rather than in one. Operating in That's it. All right, thank you. And then, um, any further questions? All right, great. So do I have a mover for this report? Raf, happy to move. I'm happy to second. All those in favour? Against? That's carried. Thank you. So then moving on to item seven, the Capital Endowment Fund. So we've got the same team remaining at the table for this one. Yes. Yep. All right. This was the report we were asked to bring back to Council um, with um, an assessment of whether we should look to apply the inflation adjustment um, to special projects that Councils may wish to do. And you'll see that we are recommending that, in fact, that does proceed. Thank you. Um, so, uh, questions first of all. And noting in the report, we've got obviously the discussion around the 60 40 split, but also the note that all of the fund um, that's able to be applied is, is currently spoken for. Would the resolution of the staff recommendation today mean that we would then be able to apply additional funds to give effect to the 60-40 split, whereas at the moment we're not able to do that because the fund is already expended? Yes, that's what we're recommending. So that the effect of this, essentially, if we were to take the staff recommendation, would be to give effect to that previous decision we made about the 60-40 split? Yes. Yeah, so the discussion today is around um, resolution one, whether we utilise all income um, and not inflation proofing for the next, inflation protecting for the next um, three years. It isn't the opportunity to talk about the 60-40 split, but the effect of today's decision would be if we took the recommendation to give effect to that split more quickly than we otherwise would be able to. So I think that's quite a a good way of, of framing the discussion that we're about to have. Further questions, Pauline? It's quite confusing because it is a bit of a chicken and an egg, and, and my question is around 4.4, where it states currently all allocations from the fund are in the innovation, economic development and environment category, with none in the civic and community category. And so I'm wondering, how did we get to that point? Do we not allocate on a 60-40 ratio as we go along? No. Staff make a recommendation, but councillors make the decisions. So they may not necessarily 
So we're not given any oversight on how the ratio is performing at that point? Then? Well, I'm not sure that that's necessarily so, but it's, it's, some of this is quite old. Um, I mean, these, these percentages have always been there. Um, I can't specifically answer, but I can only say, the same as we are now, that we do give advice on how it should fall. Mm. I mean, the question is, are we deciding to do this today in order to address that balance? No. Uh, or are we deciding to do this today in order just to access some more capital out? Yep. That's the yes. We, we're not doing this to sort the problem. We're simply saying if, if the council should resolve to do it, then it is an opportunity to address the ratio. Right. It provides the flexibility so that future decisions could address the ratio if those future decisions supported that. Yes. Yep. Tim. Thank you. We, we set this up this to put the um, to protect against inflation so that the capital endowment fund stays at a certain level. <clears throat> it's kind of like the, what we're proposing to do today is kind of like a builder dipping into deposits of houses yet to be built, isn't it? We, we we're dipping into what we the protection against inflation to this overall fund. That's exactly what we're doing, isn't it? If we, we go with this. Yes, you're using what would normally be applied <coughs> to protect the fund, but I don't think that's quite correct to what you're saying about dipping into future deposits. It's it's different. I mean, in essence, you're just simply adjusting the capital down for over a period of three years, at which point you would then continue on to inflation adjusted. Well, we, we, we're giving weight to wants rather than needs, perhaps. Well, well there then, was quite a strong um, discussion around the the meeting at which we're asked to go away and do yep. it. I mean, yep. I mean it's for, yeah. yes, it is for councillors yes. to decide, yep. but, um, but in, I suppose in a way, yes, you are. Thank That's you. entirely the, the debate we're about to have. Paragraph 4.3 of the report sets out quite clearly what the implications of um, making this change would be. Yep. Phil. Thanks, Diane. I just want to check, in your view, um, and looking at all this, are the, are the time, say, in terms of spending um, and demands on a council, when in fact you might go into into the principal part and, and expect that it comes back later because in fact there's a time of greater need for spending. Well that was the argument. Um, mm -hmm. Normally I would write this report and argue against using the capital but when we looked at the amount of money which was 200,000 which didn't seem a lot in the overall scheme mm -hmm. of things and given the demand on council for um, to meet other needs we did decide it was probably something that should be considered. Thank you. Mike. So, uh, when I'm reading 4.3, obviously it's talking about the $0.2 million per annum that we'll never get back. Right. So eventually, over a number of years, we'll actually see a negative impact from the decision we make today, which is a little bit similar to the argument here about asset sales, where we, we shouldn't sell them because of the impact we'll get later on. That's true. Um, I think it's different relativity, so. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Following on from that, while um, the money won't be in the fund anymore, we're not simply giving it away, though. That money will be spent on things that will give their own benefit to the community in future years. Is that right? That's right. There would have to be a contestable process to decide how the money was to be spent. Yeah. So while it's not cash, it is going into something of value to the community that will be used over those years. Yeah. If that was a decision that was made, yes. Yeah. Any further questions? Ref. Well, it's really, yeah, just to clarify that 4.3, what we're doing is we're front-loading spending, so there'll be a permanent reduction in what's available in the future. So you're basically bringing forward spending that you might do in the future now because you have more needs now. So there's no difference, really. It's whether you think there are more needs over the next three years and you're willing to actually take some money from the future to pay for that. The overall spend doesn't change. Well, it doesn't. It just means you're spending more in the next All right, three so years than you are in the next... This is exactly the debate we're about to have. So back to Sarah and then Glenn. Clear about that. OK. Um, so still in questions, Glenn and then Yanni. Thank you. Mine's from the silly question department. It's partly explained in 1.2 that this is in response to a council request, but the question simply is why. <laughs> why, are we, why are we doing this? You're the council. Well, why, why are we proposing? I said it was a silly question. So why are we yeah. proposing to do this? 
We were asked to bring a paper back, yep. which we have. We've tried to set the pros and cons. We obviously need to make a decision. On this occasion, I was quite out of character and recommended it. Um, <laughs> but should you decide or not to accept it, is is yep. so. You're simply pointing out the ramifications of whichever path we go. It's yep. totally fine. Thank you. Thank you, Yanni. Um, I'm just trying to understand the application process for this fund, and I think the previous report talked about having kind of business cases for it, um, and yet we've seen with Christchurch and Z there's a lot of stuff that's quite high level that doesn't seem to have had any sort of business case, you know, and discrete decision from council other than just an LTP line decision. So, going forward, if we agree to this, how do you see the application process working? Well, I think Christchurch ends it as a separate thing, and that's decided by council as part of the long-term plan. But I would see the process working as when this was done last time, whereas I understand various community boards put up um, cases for what they thought was a fair allocation of the funds in their area, and it was decided by the councillors mm -hmm. on the basis of the merits of each argument. So, I mean, I just... I wonder whether we should actually be making reference to some sort of process. Like for for someone like me who's had frustration with, you know, um, the old process in terms of halls will getting funding for their school hall, and then had other schools in my area that have had no process to get funding, uh, and it's been really people coming down the end of the table, making public deputations to council that has triggered the funding uh, reports coming back, which doesn't seem very satisfactory. So. Uh, you know, are we able to kind of highlight a uh, a report back on the on the on the process so that we can actually have a fair, you know, situation where people we know what the demands or the needs are, and if we agree to this, then we know that there's a robust process to allocate the funding. If I might, the the previous paper dealt with those issues. It sat set down in what council I think referred to as rather a prescriptive set of uh, recommendations what the process should be. Uh, just in summary, without the paper in front of me, what it recommended was that Council consider proposals at the beginning of the financial year, proposals for funding for the, for the Community Endowment Fund, make decisions on that, reviewed it at six, point of six months, and if there were unallocated funds or funds that perhaps decisions wanted to be reconsidered at that point, then a further set of decisions were made for the funding available for the subsequent period of that financial year. So I think the decisions that were taken when this was considered last at council, address those issues right. so for, for the very reasons that you've raised. Yeah. So, so the clarity really is that um, this will not be like last time in terms of community boards. This will be council laws make it, the additional money that we're considering taking oh. will, will be a matter for council. Yeah, I see. So I think last time this occurred, there was a quite separate process in terms of a special fund established that was, as you suggest, um, by, um, if you will, nomination or application from the community boards. My understanding for this is simply that the normal process that was agreed last time uh, would apply. This is simply releasing money to enable um, a decisions to be made in the way Diane has suggested. So it's not a separate or special process, it's just enabling, as you said, Chair, um, uh, that there would be funds available. Thanks. All right, thank you. Vicky. Can I just clarify in 4.5, sorry, it's not related to the guts of that issue. Um, oh. The, the Latimer Community Housing Trust, where we've paid 100,000, but the grant was 290,000. Is that because no houses have been built, or okay. what was the reason? Do you want to speak? Yes. Yeah, OK. So uh, the, the Latimer Community Housing Trust money is still allocated. Um, some money, as you say, um, has been uh, committed. Um, the second tranche of money was subject to certain things being required to be produced by, no, uh, to be produced by Latimer Latter, Community Housing Trust. We're still awaiting that information. We've been in touch and are working actively with them. We expect a report back um, by, uh, during the month of June. Um, for example, um, one of the things was, would they, could they raise additional money to support the construction? They've been unable to do that. We also understand that the resource consent um, for the location that they've got expires in June. So we expect to have a decision made in June on that matter. If in fact those conditions can't be met, I think the recommendation of staff would be to um, uh, change the decision, take the money back, which doesn't prevent that trust 
from seeking money in the future. Mm -hmm. so just as a general rule, do we put a time limit on people actually doing what they um, claim they're going to do? Sometimes. Rule, we should. Um, I think that's a very good suggestion, and Diane uh, would agree. It's <laughs> just said she agrees. I think that's very good. I think that tightening up some of these processes, not in the sense of making them more restrictive, but actually clarifying the processes are things that we need to do around this fund, and we have tried. So Thank I you. think that's a very good idea. So Thank that you. provides clarity for everybody. Okay, so Sarah's indicated she's happy to move this. So um, moved by Sarah. Do I have a seconder? Seconded by Vicky. And now we move into debate. Is there any debate on this? Pauline. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I have a certain reluctance over this, but um, at the same time, I know that the benefit from when uh, we did this last time, when was it, about four or five years ago? Mm. The benefit was incredible. We, we, that really helped things like the, um, the Spencer Park Surf Life Saving Club, which is an incredible benefit to the community now. A social enterprise in, um, in Maiho there, um, they opened up a shop. Uh, you look back and, and you can see that the benefit that this will give to the community for later is apparent. And the fact that the need is now, we have had an incredible disaster and um, even if the rest of New Zealand has kind of forgotten, we know the impact of that is still with us. And I think that in that light, um, I will support this today because I think that we really need to kickstart everything that we can and this money will benefit the communities. So I will support it today. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you. Tim. Thank you. Well, I'm not going to support this and it's very simple. This has been a fantastic fund and has done a lot over the years. There's no question about it going to communities. But we've asked our ratepayers, families etc to adjust their budgets, their family budgets, because we are putting um, rates at 5.5%. But this council is sitting around the table saying, oh, but we do want to spend more because the need's now. So let's cut into the savings and reduce this fund per annum by $200,000. The fact of the matter is we have to show leadership, and although this, in the big picture of the council funds, is a small thing, the principle is very strong. This is a fund that has done a lot, and it will be doing a lot to the needs of the future people of Christchurch. We've had the UCSA and also Generation Zero come to our long-term plan. They're going to be the leaders in the city, and in 10 years or whenever, when the needs that we have now, and we are saying there are needs and there are many, are going to be here in 10 years. We're not going to solve our issues in two, three, five or seven years. So this fund is incredibly important. And I think the last thing we should be doing by showing leadership is chipping away at its um, principles. So I would suggest, and I'm going to vote against this, and I realise there are those around that are saying let's spend it now because it's the same as in 10 years. It is absolutely not, because once we have done this, this fund will be down by $200,000 per annum. Thank you. Um, Aaron and then Phil. Yeah, I'm like Tim. I won't uh, support this. Uh, I don't believe in spending the children's inheritance, and this is what that is. If I look back, um, if you go to any inflation calculator, if Grandad put away $100 for you um, 100 years ago, that's now $1.800. Uh, uh, well, $1, and we took this off in 2013, and it's going to carry on for another three years. I'm picking the council in three years' time, we'll go, well, we'll just spend the inflation bit then, it's not that much, so on and so forth, until eventually it won't be very much money because we never inflation-proofed it. If Grandad left you that $100, it would only be $100 now, but if he inflation-proofed it, it would be $1,800. And that's what we'll do to this fund. It will just whittle down and eventually become almost worthless, and that's not what I want to leave for the legacy of our city. This was a gift to our city a number of years ago, and uh, or a windfall, however you want to look at it. And uh, let's well, the sale of an asset. But well, but do we want to blow it now, or do we want to keep it for the city long term? I, I'm voting to keep it. Others can blow it. It's your choice. Thank you, um, Phil, and then Vicky. Um, Councillors, I think part of the, the um, deputation from Poto Williams was really clear about the strife, really, that is happening for people, particularly in the east, um, who have been most affected. 
And I think that tell, should tell us that, that remind us that in fact th this this cha change in the fund is to balance the, the civic and community projects. And if we know anything, it's that seven years later, after the biggest disaster in this um, country's history, now is the time that people are being affected in terms of the whole psychosocial impact on, on our people. And I think that our future generations will actually thank us for investing in projects which will support our community development, support our people, and now is the time to do it. There'll be a time, in term, of course, when the, when the fund, fund will grow. So in effect, yes, I think it is like bringing forward spending, but I think it's a good investment. There's been some great examples of when the previous councils have done this before. Manuka Cottage, which is finally going to be, be developed in, in my ward, is a, is a good example. It's taken a long time for the people to chip away, but I pay credit to the, and to the, last count, the previous council who actually put that money aside for community developments like that, and that was very encouraging for the people at the time. And so I ask councillors now to support this one. Thank you. Vicky. Uh, as I understand this fund, it was from the sale of an Orion uh, purchased asset some considerable time ago. Um, and I noticed that in 2012-2013 that the uh, inflation-proof element was spent. We're not actually spending the fund. What we're doing for three years, when the council faces huge financial pressure, is not inflation-proofing it. So the impact, three years on, is 200000 a year. Let's just take Grandad's inheritance, because if Grandad left you $100, what Grandad left you that for was, or wanted you to have the money for, was for a happy and uh, productive life. So if you had a mental health issue during that time, or you had an issue with flooding, or the foundations of your house needed repairing, or you were affected by social isolation, or all sorts of things that you wanted to do, and you weren't allowed to access that until you were 93, um, then Grandad's wishes would not have actually come true. So I don't buy that argument at all. We are faced with major financial issues, and we've alre we're already at 5.5%. Um, in terms of a rate increase, and we have seen over this week, last week, and we'll see again next week, the huge demands that there are in the community that we are not meeting. We're not even meeting the housing need. So the idea that we have some sacrosanct fund that we inflation-proof because in 100 years' time it will be really helpful, I don't think is actually that good or useful to the people of Christchurch right now who need assistance and who need action on various things. So what we're suggesting is that instead of the inflation proof of 1.8 million or 1.7 million, depending on which paragraph you read, um, we actually are able to allocate that to really important projects over the next three years only. The impact of that ongoing is 200,000 a year from three years' time. The huge financial pressure on this council is the next three years. So I have no problem with this whatsoever. I think it's a very rational, sensible thing to do. Dave. Um, thank you. I'm probably going to take a similar line to Tim and Aaron. Uh, we seem to have a capital endowment fund that was set up <coughs> with a 60-40 split. And for me, it's disappointing, I think, that in our decision making, we haven't um, uh, been able to keep uh, tabs on that 60-40 as we're going along. And, and so we've we've probably allocated more in, in one area than, than another, and here we are today trying to adjust that balance. Um, and I, I sort of look back to the uh, reporting a few moments ago, the quarterly report, and Diane mentioned she was pleased with the uh, the efforts that some of our uh, departments are uh, bringing their expenditure into line. Uh, however, I, I do find it quite disturbing in some respects that as an organisation we we still seem to mount up uh, excesses, over overruns, overspending and under budgeting for, for all sorts of things and, and for me it would be far more preferable for this organisation to be far more fiscally responsible in their spending and, um, and balancing our books better rather than trying to tinker with this sort of a thing here. So we've set up this fund, it's an enduring fund and it will, as other speakers have said, um, dissipate as we go uh, into the years. 
um, and in, in, three, if in three years' time, we <coughs> could feasibly make the same decision that we're going to spend the interest, and eventually this fund becomes worthless. It, um, it's just not making the money that it is, so I'm not going to um, support the resolution either. Ref. I wasn't going to speak. Uh, I'm pretty agnostic about this, but I've heard some silly stuff talked here. Um, this simply is front-loading expenditure. That's all. So you're taking some cash from the future to spend now. There is no change in the fund itself. The fund is not going to dissipate. The fund is going to be managed in exactly the same way. It's got nothing to do with general council expenditure. It's a specific fund with a specific pot of money for specific community civic outcomes. Um, so really the only question you have to ask yourself is whether you think the needs are great now over the next three years compared to slightly lesser needs in the future. And I think that's really the decision we're making here today. A lot of the other stuff just doesn't make any sense. Glenn. Push the <laughs> push that button. <laughs> oh, uh, thank you. I've been um, changing my mind all the way on this. So here's where I am at, at the moment. Where I'm at at the moment is, I, th I think it comes down to what it's spent on and when. So if you look at back at 2, 12, 13 and 13, 14, that was immediately in the echo of those earthquakes. Decisions were made then. Uh, the specific projects the money went to haven't exactly uh, panned out, but I think as a housing subcommittee, we have a responsibility to engage with uh, Latimer. Uh, we're in a pretty difficult space as a community. The grief is so profound in some parts of our city, including the east, that no amount of money we will give will actually bring back what they used to have. So, for instance, the opening of QE2 will be fantastic and it will be a cairn on the journey, but it won't be the end of the journey. The loss is so great. You know, you had to be living in those homes to know what it was like. So let's get this. No amount of money we give to people will actually take them back to where they were. It's like a grief when you lose someone, you don't get them back. Money doesn't get back the past. I do agree with Phil that if and when we do choose to use some of this fund as proposed today, or the interest on it, that it's used in uh, the, uh, the area, in the psychosocial areas, because I think we do need uh, to unlock some of the resources and the tools that can assist people uh, in their journey, which uh, I think actually will be generational in terms of recovery. So I am going to break uh, my own rules uh, because normally I wouldn't uh, support doing this, uh, but we are in extraordinary times and uh, what I would like it used on is the sort of stuff that Phil's talked about. Uh, so I, I do support you know, for three years, so it's quite situational, uh, uh, using that. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie. Yeah, uh, very quickly here. Um, I, I guess there is that slight element that, um, that you are uh, cutting into something which, which you won't, won't have in the future in the sense that if you don't get a pay cut uh, or a pay rise in three years' time, you're essentially getting a pay cut due to, due to inflation. Um, that being said, the one thing that I find slightly funny ar around this is that I've heard calls of why I get rid of something uh, that makes you money to put it into something <laughs> that, uh, that won't make you money. And uh, we are right now probably going to make a decision to get rid of something that does make you money um, and, to, and to put it into something that doesn't make you money. It, it is the inflation component though. Um, and the reason why I'm supporting this is because the reason why you're a counsellor is not always to get fixated with price, but it's to appreciate value. Um, the principle is remaining the same. We're not hacking into the, uh, the overall pot. It is the inflation adjustment uh, that we're, we're touching. And as Raf correctly says, it is simply front-loading and is simply saying that there are pressures today that we believe that we can put uh, that money to good use today over the, over the next couple of years. Um, there are huge pressures on us, and I think that is a very small uh, exception to make in this time. Uh, to put this money to good use, but I, I do flag that there is a sense of irony here, though, and I will support it. Yanni. Thank you. Um, uh, when the Capital Endowment Fund was first set up, I went through and analysed all the submissions and made a graph, 
And what was really interesting, the council consulted at the time about where the money should be spent, had a range of options. Um, one of the options they considered was just giving people, you know, fifty dollars each across the city or whatever amount. Um, so everyone in the city from the, the sale of this um, uh, Orion um, gas South company Power, was South Power, sorry, um, to, to sell it. And so they went through the council went through quite a good consultation with its community over we've got this money, what should we do with it? And the overwhelming feedback was to spend it in community projects that would benefit the city. Um, at the time, actually, sadly, economic projects got the, prior the higher priority, even though the community feedback had been that actually the community projects should have been the ones that had, had more funding put towards it. Now, sadly, over time, um, what we've seen is that a huge portion of this money has gone into economic development, which actually I think you'd have to say has had pretty limited benefit to the city. There's a number of things through CDC, the old CDC, for example, that were invested in. Uh, there were things like tourism campaigns in Australia straight after the earthquake, which actually had very little impact in terms of bringing people here, because the city was actually quite broken. Um, and also, we've, we've seen um, huge money go into golf and sporting events, uh, and very little has actually gone into the community projects that have had a, a, a long-standing benefit. But when Council made the decision previously uh, to go through that community board process and take the inflation adjustment and put it into those community pro projects, that has had a major impact in areas. And a number of councils have, have raised that. You know, it's not, it was actually, I thought, quite a bold thing to do when you had a number of groups that, um, and it wasn't just Council that had insurance issues uh, of being underinsured because we had poor valuations on our assets. There's a number of community groups that are struggling to face the rebuild costs, and so we put that money back into those community projects. And they have had a benefit, and I guess the question for me is, if not now, when? Um, because we certainly have heard through the LTP the number of groups that are seeking funding from Council to do things. At the same time, we've heard from people around trying to keep the rates low. And the issue with that is that this money is not from rates. So actually, I think it's a good use of this money to put it back into community projects. Uh, I would just caution that, as has been said, that this money doesn't get um, uh, put into the big, the big events, for example. You know, it doesn't go. It shouldn't be going to pay for professional sports or for um, economic development. It does, I think, need to go back to the community. And the final thing I'd say is that, you know, I think in time, hopefully, we can address this balance, but. You know, we've set up CDC and CCT into a new entity, and at the time we agreed to do that, the council report said we we're expected to save $730,000 annually. And so, you know, if you look at this fund now, most of the money is going into those two entities, doing to the new entity, doing the work of those two entities, and it doesn't seem to be saving money. It seems to be asking for more money. So, I hope that we can address that in time in terms of the balance of this fund because I do think it needs to go more into community projects, but I support the resolution before us. All right. Mike. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I agree, obviously, the money that we're going to use is just going to front load this. Um, but in three years' time, there, there will be a reduction on what we'll be giving out of 200000 which will go on forever, well, until we do this again, it reduces even more. Um, so there will, at some point in time, be a negative impact from the decision we make today. Uh, however, um, I, I will support this because we do have a community in need, many community groups in need, and, and hopefully the money that actually we use, and we use it wisely, will actually create the value that potentially down the track will actually help reduce some of the rates increases we're getting if the money's invested wisely. Um, and it's quite interesting because we, when we look at some of the discussions we've had around rates, um, uh, sorry, um, asset sales, and the, the absolute no stance about that because of the fact it will dip into our income t for future generations, this is actually a little bit similar. And what we're doing here today is just touching the edge of a huge problem that we have in Christchurch with the lack of revenue we get. If we truly want to be bold and actually get the city on track, we actually need to look 
as strategic partners with some of our assets and sell some of our shares and bring on a strategic partner that actually in the end give us more revenue than we're getting right now from our assets. So when we make this decision, just remember the decision you're making right now is actually to reduce a revenue that we're going to get in the future, which will be very similar to what we do if we sell some of our assets, and not all the assets, just some of the shares of the assets, still maintain the majority, but then actually get a strategic partner, which actually has the potential to increase our revenue. Sarah, I'll come back to you at the end. Um, I wasn't going to comment, and I will. Um, the comparison with asset sales is an interesting one, because I certainly wouldn't see this as a comparison with a, an asset sale at all. I think all we're doing um, is um, taking a, if, if you were going to put it into the equivalent of a, a company that pays its dividends to reduce rates, um, where the, the company has a capital value, um, and where the company pays a dividend, all we're doing is structuring that company to pay a higher dividend now, and um, foregoing, and rather than investing Investing more into that company. So it's not the equivalent of an asset sale, it's simply taking a higher dividend now and, and avoiding reinvestment for future growth into the company. Um, I am also deliberately going to separate out any discussion about how we might use the fund, because that's a separate set of decisions as, we, as we've heard. Um, and of course there's been quite a bit of comment about the way that this fund was set up and the, and the reasons for it. Um, but the, the reality is that the fund was set up um, and the dividends from the fund, the interest from the fund um, delivers outcomes for our community. We've sat here for a number of days through long-term plan submissions and we've heard about needs in our community and aspirations of our community, some of which we know we're not going to be able to fund. And a lot of those are earthquake related and we are a number of years on from the earthquake. And some of them are around because of calls on our funding in recent years because of the earthquake. So we are in a unique situation. Um, and I think if there was a time for us to look at doing what we're um, looking at doing through this um, recommendation. Now is that time. Um, I had a lot of respect for the decisions that were made in the 12, 13 and 13, 14 years, um, and I've seen some of the good results from that. Phil referred to Manuka Cottage. I'm certainly aware of what the um, Birdlings Flat Community Centre has done for that community, and a community which has grown significantly as a result of the earthquakes as well. Um, if there was a time to do this, that time is now. Um, I am supportive of this. Um, and I don't believe it's our job to um, speculate on what a future council's decision might be as to whether that council would um, agree to do this for a longer period or whether it wouldn't. Obviously, the longer period for which it was done, um, the greater the effect on the, um, the future of the fund would be. But that's a decision for a future council at that time. In terms of the decision that's in front of us today, I believe that this is absolutely the right thing for us to be doing at this time, not least because of what we've heard in the last few days through submitters to the long-term plan. Um, all we're doing is taking a, a greater level of um, support from this fund now in order for it to have a small reduction in the future in exactly the same way that if we structured one of our companies to do this, we would be taking a greater dividend now to avoid reinvesting in the company at this particular time for its future growth. Sarah. basically, and there's no doubt that Christchurch has been having a pretty rainy day for the last seven years. I'm not going to go over everything that's already been said, but let's remember that it's the community aspect of this fund that we're really talking about here, at a time when we're hearing from so many groups that need our help. Facilities such as the Multicultural Centre at Hagley College, or a community pool in Edgware may be able to access some of this funding, and add value in a social and community way, rather than having the cash on hand. Councillor Kewen likened this to a child's inheritance. Yet holding on to the money while the children are starving seems completely counterproductive. And let's remember that we're not actually parceling out any of the money today, simply allowing people to apply for it. And if we have worthy projects, we'll have the debate then as to whether we allocate the money or not. This decision today isn't one to be playing games with or to be grandstanding on. Every vote is going to count. This vote needs 80% to pass. So if you are ambivalent, if you are 50-50 on this, and if you are thinking about voting against it, your vote will count and will make a difference. If you are doing that to grandstand or gain headlines, please think again. This is for our communities, communities that are currently coming to us 
asking for funding so that they can add community value, to add social value, to increase mental health and well-being in their local communities. I'd urge councillors to support this and to enable our communities to apply for funding to meet the demands that we have now. Thank you. And Sarah, I'm pleased that you pointed out the fact that this vote will need 80% um, support to carry. That means if four people were to vote against, the vote would be lost. So having noted that, um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? No. Would those people who voted no please raise their hands? Okay, can we have that recorded please? And that's carried. Thank you. Okay, so um, that's the end of the open part of the meeting. So I will now um, move that we exclude, uh, so I'll move to exclude the public um, as set out on pages 31 to 33 of the agenda um, and pages 5 and 6 of the supplementary agenda. So Pauline, you'll second that. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against. That's